Nuke tried to open his eyes. Wasn't happening. Modston, it was the bad green, he mumbled. This attracted the attention of someone nearby. Finally, welcome to slavery. I'm obligated to provide you with the following orientation talk. A slaver got out some notes and began reading aloud before Nuke slumped in a cage. The party to whom you have been indentured, hereby referred to as your master or masters, reserves the right to impose upon you any and all terms as detailed in section 2 of the slave handbook. Insofar as these provisions allow, you, hereby referred to as the slave, are to adhere to the express will of the master in a manner deemed convenient by the master or representatives thereof. As the sun set on section 1, clause 4, volume 1, Nuke finally heard enough words to work out what was going on here. His head had been cruelly shaven and his ninja sword stolen away. All he had left was his designer ninja rag shirt, which the slavers had foolishly mistaken for the actual rags common to their clientele. The prince of the empire was now its slave. The next morning he was dragged out of his cage and pointed at a big pile of rocks. Alright boy, listen up, a slaver said. I'm the fucking prince, listen to me you dreg. Nuke earned himself a slap across the face. Don't be rude. It violates Section 4, Subsection 8 of the 7th edition of the Slave's Code. Oh yeah? Well, what can I say? My copy must have been tampered with. It was just a load of weird drawings of girls in ancient uniforms getting all red in the face around some guy. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, Yasuke. The slave aside. Just be quiet, right? See that big rock? We need rocks smaller than that. Have fun. Now Nuke got to really experience the labour he'd seen near Shobatai. Hit the rock, round the clock. You were allowed the freedom to choose which part of the rock to hit next. Slaves never used to have it that good, the talk around the camp claimed. That was Nuke's life settled then. Or it would have been if a curious Warston hadn't wondered why things were so quiet, peaceful and almost happy back in the capital. He took an educated guess and checked the prison, finding Isaiah to his surprise, and then learning the truth of the matter. I'm sorry, Isaiah. I must go to him as soon as I can. We shall return for you, I promise, Wadston said. Worry not, Mr. Wadston. I've stood in one of these cages for far longer, and you have a duty to your master. I'm sure he would do the same for you. The heat in here has you deluded. I'll fetch some water. Even a mere undergraduate in jailbreaking knew that it was best to focus on a single breakout at any given time. Therefore, Wadston left Isaiah in the sizzling slammer for now, and rushed to join his classmates in the tower. I thought he'd last at least another day, Izumi said. So we have to steal the master. I'll do it, Els chirped. We'll see, Charlie. We need to work together. Prince Teshino is relying on us to save him, Wadston said. Once those idiots rescue me, I'm going to kill them for letting this happen, Nuke muttered to himself. Ooh, there's a spot no one's hit yet, quickly! Ah, so satisfying. The romance of a summer slave never dies. Well, he probably wasn't thinking that, but the guards were. Seeing virgin slabs of sweet quarry going to waste day after day. No wonder they were so tense. Anyway... Azumi, Els, and Wadston pooled their collective brain power to come up with a rescue plan. And then, with the markets in decline, the nobles will visit the camp to lay off workers, Azumi was explaining. We'll use the disguises we acquired in the second stage to infiltrate their entourage. That's where the cardboard skimmers come in. It was a genius scheme that would allow the trio to sweep Nuke away from under the slavers' noses. What's better? Hearing the plan inspired an even better one from the bottomless mind of bloody Charlie Ells, one that would achieve the very same goal in far fewer words. So it was that the next afternoon, Wadston announced his intention to purchase a slave at the gates of the stone mining camp south of the capital. Allowed entry, he left Azumi and Ells to keep watch by the gates while he searched for Nuke. He was easy enough to find. Look at these hands! Nuke was shouting. Do these look like hands that could ever harm an innocent rock? They love it! A guard claimed. 
You know, guess their rocks off. <laughs> uh, by his blood. You mean like, oh, minor senpai, harder please. Oh, oh, wait. Do you know how to draw? We gotta hear this one out. Nuke's promotion was interrupted by Wadston. Prince Tashino, you're okay, he said. Wadston, where the fuck have you been? On our way here, my prince. I got here in like two hours and I was bloody blacked out. Ah, uh, well, we had to develop a plan to ensure your successful rescue, my prince. Your apprentice proved most helpful in that regard. Apprentice? The portly Sheikh Charlie. He's still... you didn't get rid of him. Oi! The guard interrupted. Are you here to buy this thing or not? He's worth a lot to us, you know. Uh, I'm sure his father would be happy to hear someone say that of him, Wadston said with a smile. Wadston, my man, they've been here with these fucking rocks far too long, let me assure you of that. Now, would you care to execute this amazing plan you spent a bloody day concocting? At once, my prince. Excuse me, guards, everyone. Did you ever hear the story of... Oh, wait, what's that over there? Wadston cried, pointing in a vague direction. Then he scooped Nuke up over his shoulder and absolutely legged it. From under the noses of the guards indeed. Wadston may have been an aged fellow, but his hard work kept him supple and unusually powerful. The guards could hardly keep up with him as he dashed, and whenever they got close enough to thwack at him with their clubs, he dodged the blows with ease. The element of surprise helped too. The guards at the gate didn't believe the man running at them with a slave on his shoulder could really be pulling a fast one. Who would be so brazen? A man with a duty to his prince, and not enough time to cut out a load of cardboard skimmers, is the answer. Still, after clearing the camp and running up a nearby rocky embankment, Nukes flailing got the better of him, he stumbled, and a guard clobbered him to the ground. Nuke rolled out of the crash and was immediately on his feet and running. The guards didn't pursue. Finally, they knew their place. Or, more accurately, it was the usual lack of care at play. They were happy to just enslave Wadston instead. Was this what the loyal servant deserved? Surely not. Luckily, the mastermind of the breakout was already in a huff about not being trusted to carry it out himself. Now, as he and Azumi rushed out and saw Wadston being led back down to the camp, Els had his time to shine. Bloody Els, here he comes again! The Shek shouted as he charged. A battle cry, perhaps? He swept Wadston away with little effort, and thus now the guards were chasing him. The big chap had quite the pair of legs on him though, and they couldn't keep up. Azumi found Nuke breaking open his shackles just beyond the embankment. You're still around too, Nuke said. Great to see you too, Prince Tashino, come on! If you were dead or gone or whatever, I'd have said you were history. Incredibly funny! You're like a ninja of comedy! The laughs are gone before you even know they were there! Now let's fucking move! Alright, calm down. And I thought I was the one who got shafted. They joined Els and Wadston, dashing south over the lumpy bluffs of Heng. Only a single guard was able to keep up. And as the chase wore on and the darkness of night fell, even he realised he didn't actually care. Thus the crew disappeared into some shadowy crags, just a stone's throw from one of the many united cities of Nuke's empire, a prosperous market named Trader's Edge. Not that they were to enjoy its comforts that night. With talk of escaped slaves abound, best not to stride into town wearing little else than shackles and a smile. They would enjoy the cold, dry skimmer steaks from Washington's rucksack, al fresco. Took your time, didn't you? Nuke began. It was time to deploy the admonishment he'd been mentally preparing all day. They took your hair, Azumi quipped in response. She wasn't wrong. Nuke and Wadston had been balded, for in the United Cities to have hair was to be free. It's cheaper than ID papers, right? Luckily for the gang, this was a physical and psychological sore spot of Nuke's, and so his tirade was cancelled in favour of huffing, puffing, growling and scowling on the ground. I stole you, I did, El said to Wadston. Yes, well done, Charlie. That means you're mine. No, sorry to say. Uh-huh, that's what they said at stealing school. Ah, uh, yes, but those lofty academics don't know what it's like in the real world. Don't they? 
No, not at all. Not like the Lady Izumi here. Lady Izumi? Izumi asked. I mean, not to say that you are a lady, strictly speaking. She's a man? Els asked. I'm whatever you want me to be, my hideous friend, Izumi said. Oh, she said I'm her friend. Els was satisfied with the result of the conversation, it seems. They relaxed on the cool sands with the odd ear and eye open for manhunters, but their choice of crag had been quite wise in the end, for it was hidden from man and beast alike, with many local amenities in walking distance. The latter point was to come in very useful in the morning. Nuke and Watchton needed hats to avoid suspicion, and the group as a whole were collectively sharing one or two too few items of clothing, with Nuke bottomless and Els topless. Izumi was happy to volunteer coin to resolve this. Take Charlie as your bodyguard, Nuke ordered. He's a little, or a lot, he draws attention, doesn't he? Izumi complained. Yes, exactly, if you get into trouble, he'll buy you plenty of time. I don't buy things, I take them, Els proudly claimed. Yes, well, take a few sword blows for our lady here if you have to, all right? Yes, master, nothing I can't take. You've understood me perfectly. Off you go then, before I get fugging sunburn up here. The slaves were left in their nook, while the grubby girl and sizable Shek went shopping. This town, Trader's Edge, was quite a good spot for it. It had a whole tower dedicated to selling clothes. Anything you could ever want, as long as it's brown. Sums the whole world up, really. They did have some more exciting items in the bargain barrel, to which Azumi's handful of cats just about stretched. Their haul had the two slaves looking perfectly presentable. Watson was particularly impressed. Miss Azumi, how did you know? Know what? My size, my colour, my smell. What? It's just like my old gi from the palace. You're so thoughtful. I didn't... Didn't? I just... I've never seen such care. Izumi felt somehow that telling him it probably was the very same clothes he had been wearing before, flogged off here by the slavers, could hurt his feelings. Nuke was now rocking a grey turtleneck and a wide Kasa sun hat, like a ninja who had important office paperwork to attend to. All in all, the group appeared somewhat less like the two men, woman and a Shek who had been reported by the slavers the previous day. No one would suspect a thing. In reality, Wadston had already explained to Nuke that they would need to lie low for a lot longer before they could walk the roads freely again. Nuke liked the idea of lying, but low wasn't his style. How fortunate that the prince had made investments wiser than any could have predicted. There was a branch of the Thieves' Guild at the far end of Trader's Edge. Thus, Nuke and company rushed into town, their disguises holding long enough to get them into the shady thief tower. Hello, friends, Nuke said, a sword at his neck as soon as he passed through the door. Members only, a faceless shinobi grunted. Members, I'm the bloody chief thief, Nuke said, showing off his expensive label bag. Oh, you're a rich idiot. All right then. Bed and board, is it? Bed and fun, hopefully. Definitely an idiot then. Got money? Of course, Nuke bluffed. In this way, he was put up on the roof of the tower. Great views, very private, and what hotel did daily courses in murder down in the rec room? Even skeptical Azumi had to admit that the prospect of lounging around and attending the odd lecture sounded pretty good, all paid for with good old-fashioned student debt, or shinobi debt in this case. So there we shall leave our heroes for now, but alas, we are missing someone, aren't we? Well, the champion Azaya was himself about to embark to a far less luxurious land of low laying. In the middle of the night, he heard all the police in the station gathering downstairs for something called the Gen 1 Keepsakes Sweepstakes, which kicked up a lot of hooting, crying, and the occasional refrain of a song about, to quote, being the very best. As they sang such words, the prisoner they were meant to be guarding carefully dislodged the bolt on his cage and crept out onto the rear balcony. Nice to get a bit of air, but he was still trapped. The only way out of the station was through the front door. Without Nuke and friends to create a distraction, he had no chance to escape. So instead, he would just have to chill, looking up at the same sky as the others, eating the same hairy, crusty steaks peeled from the inside of a rucksack as the others, 
and waiting for fate to reunite them once more. At least Azaya could feel proud. He didn't know exactly what happened to Nuke or the rescue attempt, but he felt certain that whatever was going on out there, the gang were having a grand old adventure. And somewhere, up among the stars, poor Kalsi was too. Arazaya, don't worry, your fellow prince has not forgotten about you. Quite the opposite. Trader's Edge was a wealthy slaving town, with shelves packed with loose revenge. It was time for a high synergy working vacation worthy of that turtleneck. <laughs>